We finished most of the wiring, so let's start installing software. Unlike the previous videos, a simplified overview won't work because Canvas is not quite common knowledge for these printers. However, recording my computer screen from start to finish will take forever to watch. I figured a good compromise was creating step-by-step -step documentation to supplement this video. You will find this as the first link in the video description below. Those who want to trace my exact steps can pause when needed and reference that document. Some basic Linux knowledge helps, but you can get by without it since the scripts use basic commands. My recommendation is if you don't know what any of these mean, consider watching some YouTube tutorials. Otherwise, the riskiest part is flashing firmware. It's actually quite simple, executed by a single mouse click. The real issue is if anything goes wrong, it could break your board. Therefore, I linked additional websites in the description that I found helpful. When writing the Pi OS image, use a good quality micro SD card as it's tempting to cheap out. They disabled the default username and password for security reasons, so you need to set these beforehand. Also, enable SSH and specify Wi-Fi credentials. Otherwise, on first boot, you will need a HDMI cable and keyboard plugged in. Next step is to install Kia which stands for Clipper Installation and Update Helper. Kudos to the developers because this conveniently scripts out the install of everything you need and more. I chose to install all three web interfaces, Mainsail, Fluid, and Octoprint. For this video and documentation, I use Mainsail. Once in the web GUI, you can update the system software and back up the base configuration files. There are different methods for flashing CAN firmware, which involve three main steps. The first is compiling CAN boot firmware on the Pi and flashing it over to both controller boards. I am using the Octopus Pro version 1.0 and the EBB36 version 1.2. The second step is compiling Clipper CAN firmware for both boards and flashing that over. The final step is setting up and configuring the CAN network using the unique device IDs. That was overly simplified, but most of the build steps repeat. Honestly, it still took me an entire day because I ran into unexpected issues. Here are some tips to get around those. You can flash the Octopus by USB cable instead of the 24 volt PSU. In this scenario, both USB-C power and boot zero pins need jumpers installed. Otherwise, it won't power up over USB. This is contrary to many sources out there telling you to remove the USB-C jumper. I also remove all motor drivers as this may inadvertently suck up power. Figuring this out wasted two hours alone and I thought my board was DOA until I tested it with the 24 volt PSU as a sanity check. You must set these boards in DFU mode before loading the software or it won't read it. At this time, version 2.13 of the STM32Q programmer won't work. I had to downgrade to version 2.8 in order for the flashes to work. A future update should solve these issues. This also took me an hour to figure out through Google. I followed the exact same flashing steps for both boards and the octopus failed the first time. Worse, it appeared to have corrupted something. Again, I thought the board was defective. I went on Amazon and realized the 30 day return ended the night before, so there was some sweating going on. Additional research led me to downloading and reflashing the original bootloader. I then retried the initial software flash, which went flawless the second time, even though I didn't change anything. Moral is, anytime we say firmware flash, expect the worst. I was lucky the original bootloader file was readily available on Big Tree Tech's Git repo. Make sure to have this on hand. It's also good to learn alternate methods of flashing firmware. This may help when the GUI method fails. One alternative is writing the firmware file to a properly configured micro SD card. You insert it into the octopus, power it on, and it flashes itself, in theory at least. This one is more informational, but there are multiple versions of the octopus and EBB36 boards. They have unique chips and specifications. Whenever you run the config program, these need to be entered correctly, such as the processor model and clock reference. Find this information ahead of time. It should be readily available online. The CAN bus speed must also match everywhere. I went with 500,000, but some people up this to a million, depending on how their input shaping cooperates. 
When connecting the Pi to Octopus, use a real USA to C cable, meaning one that has data transfer capabilities and not just power. I didn't notice until the Pi failed to recognize the Octopus as a USB device. Eventually, you will need to connect the umbilical cable, which doesn't exist yet, since we didn't finish the wiring. So let's knock that out. On the Octopus, remove both jumpers from the 5V USB-C and boot zero pins. We don't need those anymore. If not done already, remove all motor driver jumpers except for the second. The extruder motor driver is on the CAN toolboard, so I'm only using the first six slots. Install the drivers and make sure the pins go in straight. The tolerances aren't that great. Finally, stick on the heat sinks. Make sure the fan voltage jumpers are set correctly. They should already be installed on the 24 volt pins. The diag headers should be cleared of any jumpers. My board didn't come with any. For those using the inductive probe on non CAN bus setups, this jumper needs to be moved to the left pin to supply 24 volts. For the umbilical cable, I am using an old style telephone cable. Buy a better one since these wires appear thinner than a 24 gauge spec. Otherwise, like home inspectors say, budget for replacement later. If you are using a USB to CAN adapter, Ethernet cable is a better bet. I'm going to plug this end of the connector to the octopus. Green will be CAN low and red will be CAN high, which is easier for me to remember. I route this cable differently to avoid interference from the motor wires. Also, I twisted the red and green data wires together to reduce some noise in the line. After that, I slip on a quarter inch PET expandable sleeve. The supply wires will be 18 gauge, which is recommended for high flow hot ends. Otherwise, the minimum is 20 gauge. These wires are connected directly to the 24 volt PSU. Note that I combined the umbilical neutral with the 24 volt in neutral of the octopus. There is also a single neutral wire connecting the 24 volt to 5 volt PSU. This provides a common reference between the power supplies. The 24 volt in of the octopus goes to an empty terminal in the 24 volt PSU. The motor in wires of the octopus board are simply pigtailed over. I jumped ahead, but I would unplug the motor connectors since the gantry needs to be moved around for stealth burner rewiring. You don't want to introduce any back current. Pi wiring. I cut a USB connector off and peeled the insulation to expose four wires. We only need the red and black. Having fancy wire strippers would help as you can't really peel this cleanly in one go. As with the telephone cable, these wires are really thin and I had to fold the wire onto itself before the smallest ferrule would even crimp on it. It was so iffy, I didn't feel comfortable leaving it like this. Your best bet is longer and thicker USB cables, and even that is a crapshoot, unless the wire gauge is marked on the outside. You pretty much have to cut the connectors off to see what you're working with. It's by luck that I found this cable with a significantly thicker 5 volt wire. The Pi is very sensitive to under voltage, and it will bitch and moan about it in mainsail. The positive wire goes to the 5 volt PSU, but the neutral goes to the 24 volt PSU. No idea why. Electricians, please chime in. On Pi versions 3 and earlier, using the micro USB power is preferred over GPIO pins, as it has built in over voltage protections. If in doubt, test it on a spare Pi. Flip the printer around. Note that the extruder motor driver has its own heatsink. Don't put it on the wrong chip you would think that it should go on the larger one. The brown wire for the inductive probe is crimped to the incoming 24 volt positive wire. It's pretty hard to get the remaining wires clean and tight. This is the best I could do with the Y and stop relocate mounted all the way forward. I expect to redo and fine tune this later on. I also have to readjust the bed and Z end stop to match Y max. Plug the motor wires back in and run the wires from the octopus heater terminal to SSR. The assembly manual diagram has these colors reversed. Make sure you don't mix the polarity because at this point, you're probably exhausted like I am. This is a good stopping point if it's already late at night. You may think it's almost done, but there's more to do before you can actually print anything. That's it for this video. If you followed along my documentation, it may look overwhelming, but it's really not that technically difficult. As always, careless mistakes can easily ruin your day. As CAN bus gets more popular with these printers, I'm sure it will be documented better. 
There's still a lot of knowledge scattered out there, so please share anything you know in the comments. This would really help the community move away from cable chains in the next version of this printer. In the next video, we will power on the printer and set up the configuration file. If you want to jump ahead, the end of this document has instructions for generating the CAN IDs and importing them into Mainsail. Thank you for watching, and as always, please like and subscribe, and see you all next time.